Welcome to the Programming Electronics Academy podcast. Join us every other week as we explore how everyday people are creating extraordinary things in the world. Find us online at programmingelectronics.com. Joining us today is Peter Voss, a pioneer in AI who coined the term Artificial General Intelligence, or AGI. He's also the CEO and Chief Scientist at iGo.ai, that's A-I-G-O.ai. For the past 15 years, Peter and his team at iGo have been perfecting an industry-disruptive, highly intelligent, and hyper-personalized chatbot with a brain for large enterprise customers. Peter, welcome. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day. Uh, you're a really accomplished guy. You've done a lot of amazing stuff. I'm really impressed building companies and doing research in uh, artificial intelligence. So just to kind of give you an idea of the people listening right now, we're thousands of software developers who are working at the junction of electronics and programming. So people kind of working in embedded devices and that kind of thing. Some, some people that are listening right now are kind of doing the garage thing. They're, you know, in their spare time, you know, they're, they're working on building things that they, you know, they think are great. Some people are software developers, uh, embedded software developers. That's their career and that's what they work on. And, um, you know, here we are talking about artificial intelligence and maybe like for some people that's like, oh, you know, that's like a really heavy technology that I might not be able to incorporate into what I'm doing right now, you know, the kind of work that I'm doing. And for me, the most exciting part of the past decade has been that I feel as though artificial intelligence, it's been an enabling technology to incorporate somewhat simply anymore into devices. For example, like image recognition is just a, a good example, right? I can, I can make an API call use somebody else's model, and I can categorize or classify an image with lots of issues, right? Somewhat, you know, but generally I can do it okay. And I'm, and that's exciting. But that's an example of a narrow AI. It sounds to me like you're more into artificial general intelligence. And that's where um, I'd kind of like to start this conversation because some people might not know the difference between narrow AI and general AI. So I'm kind of curious, just like if you could maybe tell the audience what, what the differentiators are there. Yes, certainly. I'll be, be happy to talk about that. Um, just before I go into that, I just, just want to say, you know, thank, thanks for inviting me. And my own background is actually electronics and building electronic stuff. Uh, so I can very much relate to, you know, your, your audience. Uh, that's really what got me excited about getting into programming ultimately it's really falling in love with being able to program you know electronic chips and so the intersection between hardware and software is certainly something i can can relate to and as you say and nowadays hardware has become so powerful that you can actually do some pretty exciting things on the hardware itself uh, in addition to being able to just have you know this, the vast cloud capabilities of all sorts of fancy algorithms that, that are just on tap. Um, but let me let me answer your your your, your question. So artificial general intelligence um, is really the same as what the original meaning of AI was all about. When the term AI was coined some 60 odd years ago, it was really about building thinking machines, machines that can think and learn and reason the way humans do. And, you know, at the time they thought, you know, we'll probably crack this in a few years. Well, it turned out to be a hell of a lot harder than, than, than that. So what happened over the decades, um, the term AI has really morphed into what, what is practically narrow AI. So instead of building a thinking machine, you know, basically building, creating some software that can think and reason and learn the way humans do, uh, what people ended up doing is to tackle one problem at a time and say, how can we write software to solve this problem? And there's actually a profound difference that, that is underappreciated. And with narrow AI, the intelligence really resides in the programmer. 
or in the data scientist and not so much in the algorithm. So it's the, the data scientist that figures out how can we solve this particular problem by writing some algorithms or training some, some model. So, you know, for example, we have sort of the first wave of AI. DARPA talked talk about three waves of AI. And the first wave of AI is sort of logic approaches uh, to, to AI. And Deep Blue, uh, IBM's um, chess world champion uh, program, is a good example of that. And it's not that they built a machine that could figure out how to, to play chess. Uh, it was the programmers that basically thought, how can we use the power of computers, the specific capabilities of a computer, which was largely brute force, but not entirely brute force, but basically how can we be smart about using what computers can do to solve the problem of playing ch chess really well? And they did that. And so you have the same in other applications, whether it's container optim optimization or medical diagnosis or uh, some expert system where basically a flowchart is created and you know with the knowledge of, of, of people. So uh, that's narrow AI. And the, the current wave of machine learning, deep learning, is also narrow AI. And I'll expand on, on that. Uh, a little later. So when I entered the field of AI, I was kind of disappointed to find out, you know, this is what AI was doing. And I said, well, I'm really interested in, in getting back to the original dream. And, and I think that hardware and software capabilities have progressed enough over the decades that we can now have a, um, a shot at this, you know, that we can actually make progress towards building thinking machines. So in, in 2001, I got together with a few other people who had similar uh, ideas, and we actually coined the term, three of us coined the term artificial general intelligence or AGI to get us back to this original uh, dream of building thinking machines. And we wrote a book you know, with that, that title on, on that, uh, that topic. So really, that's what I've been focusing on. And, and I think it's quite feasible, it's quite possible for us to actually build thinking machines in the very near future. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about deep learning and um, in my mind, so I studied neuroscience back in like the early 2000s before kind of like the deep learning, at least it seemed to me at the time before, you know, I was I like, I like to say I, I learned about back propagation before it was cool. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, there was a, there was really kind of a phase shift, like for, I guess it seems like there was a phase shift in image recognition capabilities that happened between like, I don't know, early 2000s and after 2000s, where like that narrow deep learning algorithm at least created a capability that we didn't have before. And, you know, as I reflect on that, I, I, part of me begins to think that maybe that use of it has, is something that doesn't happen very often. Like the discovery or the our creation of that is is like a general, you know, like a once in a generation kind of like discovery, for example, like our ability to now use and understand this algorithm. And it's gotten us, you know, it's not like it's gotten us obviously general artificial general intelligence by any stretch. It's like anybody who uses uh, these deep learning algorithms know that they're flawed in many different ways. But if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that you don't think deep learning, and I think a lot of people would agree with this, deep learning is not going to get us to AGI, artificial general, general intelligence. We need a, a different algorithmic approach to get there. Is, is, that under, is that correct? Because part of me thinks like, well, um, let's say one if statement isn't going to get me, you know, lots of choices. But what if I had lots of if statements that all kind of like were interdependent? Could I then get to something more complex? And so part of me thinks, well, like, is deep learning the building block to AGI, or is is do we just need to like really rethink the whole the whole structure of of, uh, of that? And, that? and I guess I'm kind of curious with your company, Igo, is that is that the approach you're taking, where you're you're kind of rethinking the entire approach for for creating a, a general more general intelligence? Yes, certainly. So a couple of things. Uh, certainly, deep learning, machine learning. Uh, we've seen a revolution. You know, it, it, uh, it's, it's really a, a phase shift of what's possible uh, to do. Now, the interesting thing is 
largely the technology that's used in deep learning, machine learning has been around for decades. You know, as you say, uh, neural networks, back propagation mm -hmm. and, and so on. And really the breakthrough was that we suddenly had some very large companies that had massive amounts of data, massive amounts of compute, uh, and they put that together in, you know, tweaking the algorithms a little bit. And suddenly by, you know, just scaling up the operation, really, that, that was the, the, the major breakthrough. Suddenly things were possible that, that we just hadn't, what weren't able to do before, like speech recognition significantly improved, you know, with, with deep learning image recognition you can use for autonomous cars. And then, of course, what happened then is, because of these early successes, you know, massive amounts of, of, of money went into the field and uh, people came into the field. So more and more people were working on this because of the excitement and the money. So this has sort of a, a virtuous cycle. Uh, and I'll talk about the downside of that, where, you know, these deep learning, machine learning technologies and reinforcement learning suddenly saw you know, so much more development than they'd ever seen in the past. And people came up with clever tweaks for this and different ways of combining and modifying them, you know, to give us ultimately AlphaGo and GPT-3 and, and, and things like that, that are very, very impressive. But as you said that, you know, they are not AGI, not by, not by a long shot. And the interesting thing is even the head of uh, DeepMind, you know, which is, you know, a giant organization, I don't know, they have six, seven, eight hundred PhD level people working on deep learning, machine learning. And the, the founder of the company said, deep learning is not going to get us to intelligence, not by a long shot. Now, coming from him, that's a pretty strong statement, you know, and uh, Jeff Hinton, you know, the, the considered often as a father of deep learning, a few years ago said, we should throw it all out and start over. I think he's changed his mind a little bit. He's, I think, more bullish on, on deep learning more recently. But uh, I think, the, yes, I think there's a, a, a general appreciation that deep learning, machine learning is not AGI. And also, I think more and more people believe that it can't get us to AGI. And there, there are some very fundamental and straightforward reasons um, of what the limitations are. Uh, for example, they don't have, what is generally accepted is they don't reason. There's no reasoning ability, but there also is isn't real time learning. You you know you can't teach the system new things in real time, which is clearly an essential part of intelligence. So they don't reason; they really don't learn. Uh, and and I could go on. I've I've written extensively about that in my articles on Medium.com. You can find them find them there. So you know some some people still stick to the idea um, like OpenAI claim that if they just had a million times more data or whatever the number is, you know, a thousand times more data, that GPT-X will actually be uh, general intelligence. But I think that's becoming the minority uh, view. And maybe the CEO of Open Mind said that so that you can get another couple of billion dollars from Microsoft. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if he really believes it or not. And then, of course, there's also the, the, the point that, yes, in, in the limit, if you develop deep learning, machine learning, if you if you stretch the definition of it far enough, you know, of a general neural net, you could say, well, our brains are neural net. And, you know, so therefore we can ultimately use it. But it wouldn't really be called deep learning, machine learning. It certainly wouldn't be relying on back propagation and, and so on. So I think it, it's, it, it's sort of a, a bit of a semantic trick saying, you know, that these models can get us to human level intelligence when really fundamentally a different technology is required. And so this is, yes, what, what we are doing. I mentioned that uh, DARPA have, have uh, a model where they talk about three waves of AI. And the first wave was basically good old fashioned AI, you know, logic based system, essentially. And the second wave, of course, is the tsunami that hit us with deep learning, machine learning. And that's the wave we're in right now. And the third wave though, is, is what would probably be best described as a cognitive architecture, where you the adaptability, the ability to learn and reason is the key requirement. 
So you start off by saying, what does intelligence require? And you build an architecture that addresses those requirements. That's fundamentally different from deep learning, machine learning. Now, there have been some cognitive architectures similarly to, you know, neural nets have been around for decades. And people used to say, well, they don't work. We've tried for decades. Well, they don't work until they do, you know. Yeah. And one could argue similarly that uh, cognitive architectures have been around for decades. And, well, people say, well, we've tried them. And they didn't work. Well, yeah, again, we would argue that they don't work until they do, until you figure out how you can make them work. So I believe cognitive architectures are, are the third wave and, and uh, is a technology that will get us to, to AGI. Now, uh, one other comment you made was uh, about, you know, if you have one if, if then statement, it's not going to get you very far, but maybe if you have billions, uh, you, you'll get there. And of course, that's that's very true. If if you believe uh, uh, that basically a current computer technology from a hardware point of view uh, can get us to human level intelligence, you know, if, if, if one has that belief, then, well, it, it's NAND gates all the way down, basically. You know, I mean, we know that basically any logic algorithm, anything you can you can do on a computer, basically can be um, assembled with just a lot of NAND gates. So uh, yes, ultimately it is programming. You know, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's microcode, it's uh, machine code, whatever it is. You know, it's code that's embedded in the chip. So yes, at the very low level, it it's it's all. If statements, <laughs> but that doesn't help you when you're designing high-level algorithms. You really have to have a model that is, you know, either sort of more like good old-fashioned AI or more neural netish, or a cognitive architecture. And one of the things that's actually always uh, troubled me when I when I started studying artificial intelligence is this schism between good old-fashioned AI and neural nets. You know, they have their own conferences, they talk a different language. It, it's very unfortunate because pretty much everything that you can do in logic AI, you can also do in neural nets and vice versa. It's just often not the best model to be thinking about the problem. Some problems are just much, much better understood and solved by using neural networks and others more by, by logic. So, you know, choosing the right model and the right tools, the right way of thinking about the, the problem can make it much more efficient to, to, uh, to, to solve a problem. But ultimately, yes, these are all, you know, first, second, third wave are all ultimately if statements or NAND gates, you know, when, is, it, uh, when it yeah, comes down is, to it. This is fascinating. So um, my current understanding of deep learning um, from the experience I've had is that it is very, like you said, data intensive. That is a big piece of the the puzzle. Having an, an, enough data to train, you know, a network in order to produce results that are um, reasonable. Do you see data intensity as being the same the same way for artificial general intelligence? Would a would an architect cognitive architecture also rely on lots and lots of data? Uh, no, quite the opposite. And in fact, let me talk a little bit about what what we're doing. So um, I started out in two thousand one, put an R and D company together. We had about a dozen people working on it to turn my ideas that I've been working on for several years into actual prototypes. You know, of an AGI, an early AGI prototype. And over many years, we developed that into something that we could actually commercialize. We 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 first started out with sort of building a virtual critter in a virtual world and experimenting around with that. But over, over the years, we decided that we could actually make more progress by focusing on uh, natural language understanding uh, rather than sort of sensing, you know, vision and uh, dexterity and so on. So robotics, robotics is really hard and um, also not that easy to commercialize. So we, we sh shifted our focus on uh, natural language understanding. And that's really what my companies, uh, both in terms of development and commercialization, have been, what, what I've been doing over the last 20 years. So iGo.ai, we have a chatbot with a brain. Uh, that's how we describe it. Now, there are lots of chatbots. There are thousands of chatbots out there. None of them have a brain. 
They don't have a cognitive architecture. They can't think. They can't learn interactively. They can't reason. You know, and we can oh, be painfully, know, painfully oh, aware I, of that. Oh, <laughs> painfully. You would. I, I remember when Alexa first came out. My hope was like, oh, these are going to be great in no time. And honestly, sometimes I think they're gotten. They've gotten worse. I don't know. I, you know, it's yeah. But anyway, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. But wow, I think everybody listening knows that their natural language processing abilities of just any of these are just subpar, not not living up to our expectations. Right, they are getting getting worse in in one sense, and that is they try to have more and more functionality that they add but that makes it easier for them to get confused. Uh, just let me quickly talk about uh, chatbots and the you know, difference having a brain or not having a brain. So all the chatbots other than the one we provide, as far as I'm aware of, use basically first and second wave technology. They use second wave technology as a categorizer. So if you say, you know, blah, 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 weather, it basically says, oh, okay, weather. So there's a, a model that basically just is a categorization model. It takes whatever you say and guesses, categorizes from that statistically, basically what is the most likely thing out of the hundreds of things that Alexa can do that you want to do. So, so that's the categorizer. And if you say, I hate Uber, don't ever give me Uber again, chances are it will trigger the Uber app, you know. And then, so that's the one part is the categorizer. And then the second part is basically a little flowcharty type program that somebody writes where it says, okay, where do you want to go? How many people are going? And do you want Uber X? But it's, you know, it's a simple flowchart program. And, and that's how all chatbots uh, that are out there are, are done. There is no reasoning engine. They don't use context um, unless somebody very carefully, you know, wrote some program to maybe use the previous utterance that you did or the previous task that you did. Uh, but there's basically no, no intelligence be, uh, behind there. So uh, our approach is... Uh, to to have this cognitive engine, this proto AGI engine that actually has deep understanding of what you say, so it does a deep pass, uh, but it does that pass contextually. What is the conversation about? Who are you talking about? What is the topic? Is this? Are you having a business discussion? Are you having? You know, are you talking to to your spouse? So it takes context into account. It takes into account what was said earlier, and it learns interactively. And we have some demos on our website that, that you know show how, how we do that. Now, we're still a long way from human level understanding, but we believe we have the core architecture to do that. And to get back to your original uh, question here in terms of, you know, does that approach require a lot of data? No, not at all. It's the opposite. It's the quality of the data that matters, not the quantity. So we basically uh, have an ontology you know the, the the background knowledge that you need to 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 have to to have understanding of it. Now, the deeper your understanding, the more background knowledge you need. But you know it's it's measured in you know tens and hundreds of thousands of of, of facts, maybe millions, not zillions. You know, as as deep learning or GPT three, for example, they brag about. I, I don't know what the number is now, but it's basically gazillions of right. you know words that have been fed in so is that ontology then like provided like you're creating that ontology or is that ontology like or is that context being extracted from the interface so i'm talking to my wife or i'm having a business discussion is that that context right there is pre-ingrained in like wherever the domain that the the intelligence might be at for yeah. example let's say i'm on my Let's say I, I've, I'm running a business and mm -hmm. I've got a chatbot that is, you know, helping people find customer answers or some answers mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. issues. So then that chatbot knows, okay, the domain I am operating in is, you know, X, Y, Z. Like I've told it ahead of time, this is the domain. And yeah, that's where it's kind of getting that context then? Yeah, yeah. Very, very good question. Uh, and, um, you know, I can use an example. One of our big customers is 1-800-Flowers. And we, uh, they use iGo basically as a concierge service that um, can help you with your, your gift, 
gift buying, you know, and uh, be hyper personalized. So there are essentially, if you think of it, of three concentric circles of, of ontology and knowledge that, that we have. The inner circle is the common knowledge that is shared across all different applications. You know, it's about knowing about people, places, time how to hold a conversation, how to start a conversation, how to end a conversation. So that's a common knowledge. And we're continually expanding that, that the system, you know, has more and more knowledge. So that's a core ontology. Then the, the second layer, the sort of next outer circle, uh, there is the domain-specific knowledge that we need to teach it. So, you know, for 1-800-Flowers, they have uh, 12 different brands, you know, Harry and David and popcorn and, uh, you know, the chocolates and the cookies and so on. So the specific terminology, their product categories, you know, whether you, for example, whether you're buying for an anniversary or birthday, you know, we need to make sure that the system has has that kind of ontology, the knowledge that recognizes what these terms mean and how they relate to each other. Also business rules, you know, if you, you know, are you a passport member that you have certain privileges and, and things like that. So we teach it that uh, ontology and either we can do that for the customer or the customer can do it uh, with certain tools that, that we provide. Now, the third layer, the outer layer uh, is the customer specific ontology so that's when you talk to Igo and and you say i want to you know i want to buy some roses for my niece amy who has a birthday next thursday now that is unique to you so you are now teaching the system in natural language that part of the ontology and Igo will remember that and so, you know, a, a year from now, I go, might be, we might set up, I go to be proactive and say, hey, your niece's birthday is coming up. Do you want to send some roses again? She really liked them if we happen to know that you like them. <laughs> right. No, absolutely. That's uh... um, so there are basically these three levels of ontology. But as you can see, they none of them are big data in the, in the sort of sense of deep learning, machine learning. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Oh, I've got so many questions. I I know we've got limited time. I'm I'm really curious how like the that ontology actually gets encoded. You know, I'm curious, but I, I don't want to go there. I, maybe it's a little too technical, right. but uh, I am kind of interested in talking about this that third circle you mentioned, which is mm -hmm. the context of the person. And you know, I think I'm sure lots of people have kind of like thought about this kind of thing, but you know, like our preferences, uh, the situations, how we act. All of those things, I imagine, could be captured by a machine or an algorithm and kind of help develop each of our own personal proxies, right? So like I would have a, you know, people would have their own proxies that would basically be a, um, yeah, this is what Mike prefers or this is what Peter prefers or Amy prefers. And like, these are the relationships Michael has. And, you know, wow, Michael seems to have a quick temper sometimes when it's late at night and he hasn't eaten today, you know, like all of those kind of things that would begin to like kind of form a proxy of like the decisions I might make or the preferences I might have. And then like, I just think, you know, let's say I'm using a web browser and that web browser has access to my proxy. Then now that could act as like the third circle for, you know, I go or, you know, any intelligence that I, I would be interacting with. So it's like, I'm providing, I'm like, allowing my data to be shared with a, you know, a third party intelligence, because I darn it, I want this thing to respond to me in an appropriate way. That seems like, I mean, is that, I'm just curious, is that the kind of like, does, let's say I go to, you know, 1-800-Flowers and I go is kind of like characterizing me in some way. If I go somewhere else where I go is operating, is it, is that information coming over or does it have to kind of like relearn that about Mike? All right. Well, you 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 cotton straight onto our our vision as a company. So yes, very much so. So we call that vision that path that we're on uh, a personal personal assistant, because yes, right now uh, we are working with large enterprise companies. So they control the, the obviously the the Igo chatbot. You know, it's and and they protect the data. In fact, it runs behind their firewall. We are not a SaaS company, and people actually like that model a lot, where we deploy, we provide the technology that they can integrate into their technology stack. We help them do that. You know, these things all run in the cloud these days anyway. 
but it's in their cloud service. You know, it's right. essentially okay. on wow, it's essentially on prem. So, so they totally control the data and that, and we don't have to, you know, don't have to worry about outages and and you know things like that. But the the vision that you're painting, as I say, we call that a personal personal assistant because yes, you might be interacting with Igo with one eight hundred flowers, and the flowers uh, Igo knows something about you. You know your. Uh, that you have a good temper, that you're in a good mood and early in the morning, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> who, you buy, who, you, <laughs> who you buy gifts, who you buy, buy gifts for and for what occasions and what the relationship is to these people and, you know, where they live and whether you deliver it at their, at their office or at their home and, you know, all of that kind of stuff Igo can learn. But now if you also using, if we have Igo deployed with your bank or with AAA and you have a breakdown on the side of the road, that IGO wouldn't know anything about that. It might have learned, you know, from from other IGOs. So the ultimate vision is is what we call a personal personal assistant. It should really be called a personal 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 assistant because uh, the word personal actually has three different meanings that are relevant here. The first meaning is personal that you own it, you control it. It serves your agenda not some mega corporation's agenda, you know, not Siri, not Alexa. So it's yours. You control it. That's the first personal. The second personal is, is it's personalized to you. You know, it knows your preferences, your history, your desires, and, your, you know, your relationships and timetable and, and all of that. So it's hyper-personalized. It's customized to you. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And the third personal is the, the, the security, the privacy issue, that things that are personal to you that you don't want to share with other people. So you can entrust it your deepest secrets, basically, and you decide what you want to share with whom. So ultimately, that becomes almost like an exocortex, like an extension of your, of your personality, of your, your mind, that you have your own personal personal uh, assistant so we we are working on that as well but uh, you know as it's more consumer product so it's a lot harder to get get into that market where people are currently used to getting these things for free free in quotes you know you're selling your soul um selling but, your attention right i think is <laughs> yeah right um, so, but, you know, there are applications uh, like, for example, we're using Igo as a personal assistant for salespeople. You know, salespeople hate using Salesforce. And so if you can just have an Igo that you can talk to and say, tell me about my next sales appointment, you know, what product were they interested in? Do they have, any, does he have any kids or you know, what are their hobbies or, or whatever. So Igo can tell you if that information is available. And then when you're done with your sales call, you can say, Igo, remind me next Tuesday to follow up, send them brochure X and let my boss know what's going on. You know, that, that kind of thing. Now, once you're using Igo like that at work, then obviously it's a small step to then say, hey, Igo, remind me to pick up the kids on the way home. And then, you know, your spouse wants an I go as well, of course, you know, and, and so, right. so uh, that, I mean, the, the, yeah. yeah, I feel like what you're describing is just the holy grail of what everybody really wants right now to be able to say a sentence that makes perfect sense to you and I and have an intelligence, be able to just like understand all the context in there and actually do it correctly. <laughs> Oh, right. it's just, and it's that's, just that's wonderful, what, you know. Yeah, to that's think what about. we're doing. Yeah. And you know, the we 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 have the core technology to do that. We have the 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 right approach. I'm confident of that. But it's it, it's a hard problem to get all of the subtleties of uh, common sense knowledge and common sense reasoning that we just pick up being, you know born into this world and interacting with the, with the world and people for, you know, as we grow up. So it's non-trivial to get that kind of general background knowledge that, that we have. Now, I, I mentioned earlier sort of one of the downside of the success of deep learning and machine learning is that it's really sucked the air out, the oxygen out of the air in terms of AI development. Uh, you know, tremendous progress has been made in developing neural nets, backpropagation, you know, reinforcement learning, and tweaking these algorithms, working with massive amounts of data. The, the tools that are available are fantastic. But on the other hand, it's basically nobody's working on real intelligence because, you know, you want to 
do you want to do a PhD? Well, you, you know, you're not going to get a sponsor unless it's deep learning, machine learning. You want to earn the big bucks? You've got to work in that field. You know, you want to get funded in a startup? It's got to be deep learning, machine learning. So uh, it, it it basically has, you know, crippled other approaches and approaches like uh, the third wave, like uh, cognitive architectures that, you know, really nobody's working on that. And the only reason we're working on it is because I am from a theoretical perspective that I, I actually spent quite a few years, about five years, studying intelligence, different aspects of intelligence before I even started working on this. You know, how do children learn? How does our intelligence differ from animal intelligence? What do IQ tests measure? And really understanding deeply what intelligence requires. And once I understood that, it was clear to me all through this, you know, tsunami craziness of, of uh, successes of deep learning that it cannot be the right approach. You know, it doesn't address fundamental requirements of intelligence. You know, if, if you had a personal assistant that couldn't reason about things or that needed to go back and be trained for 24 hours on new data, you know, it, it clearly isn't, it isn't the right approach. I mean, a child, you know, three-year-old child, you can show it one picture of a giraffe and it'll recognize giraffes in different colors, shapes and sizes and so on. Whereas with deep learning, you need, you know, thousands of, of examples and number crunching forever. So there, there, there are inherently just a lot of fundamental, it's fundamentally the wrong approach for general intelligence. So that's the reason we, you know, we look at what can we learn from deep learning, machine learning, Is there, are there some algorithms, are there some tricks, there are some data models that we can use, for example, in speech recognition, uh, yes, that's that's very useful, the statistical approaches and using them. But as far as the core reasoning using context, deep understanding, they're actually pretty useless. All right. Wow, well, that's fascinating. All right. I think I got one last question here. Um, and I, I want to kind of try to bring this back to the, the folks listening who might be thinking to themselves like, well, okay, maybe, maybe some of the people have attempted to use like a narrow AI in their application. For example, I know a common one um, is that you can, you know, you can get like a mini TensorFlow running on an edge device and you can use a pre-trained model to recognize like faces, for example. So the camera might take a shot of somebody's face and then it can say, okay, hey, this is this person. I'm going to unlock the door because I know it's, you know, mm -hmm. my wife or whoever. And that's pretty cool because I can oper operationalize it. You had mentioned that your Igo is not a SaaS company. And that's, you know, for somebody listening, SaaS is just software as a service. But, and you know, I've heard this example, I've heard this term thrown out there, intelligence as a service. Mm -hmm. And um, that's kind of like when I envision, I was just working on a application the other day that did image recognition. And I, it was literally, it was like an API call. So I'm making an API call to a to something and I'm getting like a little nugget, we'll call it in quote unquote mm -hmm. intelligence, right? A very mm -hmm. narrow intelligence, but it was right. doing a specific task for me. And I'm just wondering like, how how do you see potentially like IGO, that more reasoned intelligence being operationalized for like ye old developer who's like, you know, boots on the ground, I'm a developer. Mm -hmm. I wanna try to implement some intelligence in, in my device. Um, some reasoning in my device. Like, I don't know. I know this is like a very futurist kind of question, I guess, mm -hmm. but um, you know, I don't want to stick us to like, you know, anything necessarily practical at the moment, but I'm just like in the future, what do you, what do you see? Like how somebody might actually grab onto that a developer might actually grab onto that intelligence and implement it in something. Yeah. So uh, two things. Uh, the one thing I was shocked uh, when I started working on AGI on, on, on our prototypes of how much we could achieve with relatively little CPU and memory. You know, I started working on this 20 years ago. Now, obviously, in 20 years, the amount of, you know, processing power that we have on, you know, on a, on a, on a phone is just ama amazing. I mean, our current iGo in the normal mode that it runs could easily run on a smartphone, the, the, the amount of CPU that you have on and memory you have on a smartphone. So we actually, you know, and, and of course it keeps growing. So basically a single IGO can actually run not quite on an edge device. They don't tend to have enough memory yet, but, you know, probably soon. I mean, we're talking about a gigabyte of memory or so, you know, it's not, not a lot. Mm. Um, you can certainly have a, sing, a small, you know, single board 
computer that that could could run Igo. So so first of all, we can make Igo available, you know, on running on a very small device, and it's something I'd I'd like to do. It's just it needs to make commercial sense to to be able to to do that. The other thing, if you really want it as an API call, we do we do expect to offer Igo services as as a service, you know, intelligent as a service. Now, one thing I'd like to mention here is it can't be just a normal REST API because that undermines the whole idea of intelligence is being able to take the context of what was said earlier, uh, the, the personalization, what you learn about the person. So if you want that, you really, I mean, it can still be a REST call technically, but you need to then reference a brain that you're talking to. And that's actually the way I go is implemented that when... Uh, when a you know a chat comes in or an, an input voice input comes in, you have to identify what brain am I talking to, and then that needs to be routed to that brain that that is that had the conversation before. Now, when you're done with your conversation, that brain might go to sleep, but you know, next day or next week or next hour, or whenever when you start talking to Igo again, you, we need to wake up that brain. It needs to go back to the same brain because you wanted to remember what you said yesterday and the day before, you know, what your preferences are. Oh, that's fantastic. Awesome. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Uh, I know this is this has been fascinating for me. I'm sure all the listeners are excited and pumped up and definitely want to mm -hmm. check out iGo. Um, is there any any last thoughts you want to leave the listeners with? Again, these are developers out there. They're uh, where the rubber hits the road kind of folks, you know. I don't know if you have any final thoughts to leave with them. Yes, I mean, I would love more people to get excited about AGI and talk about and say, hey, let's do it. You know, I, I believe... We have the hardware and software that we can actually get, you know, to have much higher general intelligence we have now, I would say, to get to human level intelligence, but I don't want to scare people off. <laughs> That's a whole nother topic. But we can have the kind of personal assistant that we'd all like to have, but more people need to be working on it. So I, I think more people talking about it and what's possible with the third wave of AI, cognitive architectures, and you know, say yes, deep learning, machine learning is great, but it's just not going to get there. We're looking, we're looking under the wrong, wrong lamppost, you know, uh, and that's where all the light is shining uh, right now. That's not going to be the solution to AGI. And yeah, if you're interested more, as I said, uh, I have a number of articles on on that. Short articles on Medium.com, not ter very technical. You can find them, and also our website, Igo AI. And of course, if you know any enterprise companies that are struggling or unhappy with their chatbot, which should be pretty much every large company that should be unhappy with their chatbot, um, get them to talk to us and chatbot with a brain. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time, Peter. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. This show is produced by Programming Electronics Academy, an online technology education company. We exist to help you create the technology you want in your life. If you are interested in learning more about Arduino, we welcome you to sign up for our free Arduino Crash Course, a 12-part video series with accompanying written lessons designed to teach the basics of programming Arduino. To register for the course, simply text your email address to 440-701-5311 or you can visit programmingelectronics.com and sign up there.